Hi there, and welcome to your first of two lectures about art in uh, 20th and 21st century China. Today, we're really going to look at the first, say, half of the 20th century and just a couple of important painters and, uh, and um, artists and a couple of important ideas to keep in mind about the development of the arts in China during what really has been an incredibly turbulent 109 years in uh, the history of China. So just a couple of key dates that you should keep in mind just to get the general picture of or the general outline of what's happening in China during this time. Remember, we're talking about the Qing Dynasty, an imperial or monarch, uh, an imperial society with an emperor at the top up until about 1911 when there's a revolution that overthrows the imperial uh, rule of China. By the end of the eight, 19th century, the end of the 1800s, the Qing Dynasty had become rather corrupt, rather decadent, and uh, I mean subject to a lot of criticism from below and um, really unstable. And one of the kind of nails in the coffin of the, the Qing Dynasty was this war in the, the end of the 19th century. It's not the most significant thing that ever happens during the Qing, but it's significant in that it's sort of like the straw that breaks the camel's back. You know, there's a war between um, China and Japan, largely over control of Korea, which if you know your... Um, geography at all. Korea is sort of like a little, uh, you know, um, spit out from the coast of China that connects between China, basically between the mainland of China. It's a little bit of a bridge toward the islands of Japan. And so it's a strategic location for Japan and China. And uh, there's a, a turf battle that basically a war that goes on over China or, or over Korea in the end of the 19th century. And the, it's one of the last great spasms of, you know, trying to spend um, money and resources to keep control that really is the, the beginning of the end for the Qing dynasty. There's a lot of other things going on, a lot of discontent with the way China's being ruled, there are people starving, you know, there's all kinds of trouble. And by, uh, and of course, there's all these sort of modern ideas and uh, Western ideas that have been pouring into China, these anti-imperial ideas as the 19th century rolled on and as there was more contact with the outside world uh, and this sort of bubbles up from below and, and um, results in the end of the Qing dynasty, um, the beginning of the found, or the founding of the, the Republic of China. The, and given that name because the idea was that it was going to be a representative government, not an imperial top-down government, but a government from the people up. Um, that, that would, um, you know, reform society and reform government. Uh, so this really starts at the, in mid-1911 with the re resignation and stepping down of the last emperor of China. 1912, the official founding of the, the Republic of China. The Republic of China lasts until 1949, and during the time that the Republic exists, it's never completely stable. You actually have a couple of civil wars going on, you have control, or, or struggles for control, you have um, ethnic warlords who still want control over parts of China, and so the Republic is never that strong. And in 1949, as a result of a battle between um, different ideological sectors of the revolutionary movement, um, China becomes a communist go uh, country w and changes its name from the Republic of China to the People's Republic of China in 1949. Uh, starting in, in 1949 until his death, then the People's Republic, this communist um, regime, was led by Mao Zedong. And um, we're basically going to look at art during this time period and a couple of interesting trends that happen in the with this as the backdrop. Uh, but basically during the time that Mao Zedong is the, the uh, ruler of China, the communist leader of China, he tries to implement great sweeping reforms in Chinese society. And uh, as a result of that, art takes a couple of different turns. And so actually, all through this period, as a result of new ideas and a revolutionary kind of kicking out the old rhetoric, we're going to see a lot of changes uh, as well as continuities in Chinese art during this period. Mao Zedong actually dies in 1976, and then there is a bit of a struggle for control, um, well, actually during the last years of his life. And then uh, from 76 until the early 80s, uh, Communist China is led by a guy named Deng Xiaoping, who is a little bit more l lenient and a little bit less ideological than a guy like Mao. Uh, Mao Zedong was responsible for 
all, all kinds of repressions in Chinese society. Deng Xiaoping encouraged a little bit more economic liberalization, and then after Sh Deng Xiaoping uh, into the modern period, into the contemporary period, um, well, all kinds of interesting stuff has happened, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So these are just a couple of key dates. I want you to get the idea of this pattern of um, revolution and instability that are part of the 20th century in Chinese culture as well as in Chinese art. All right, but to begin at the beginning, in the early 20th century, as I was saying before, the Qing Dynasty, you know, was unpopular, but by the end of the Qing Dynasty, it had become very unpopular, and everything associated with the old imperial way of governing uh, China had become unpopular. And as some of the movements that are the ideological underpinnings of the revolution in 1911 that leads to the founding of the new Republic of China in 1912, some of the things that people say is, you know, we have to embrace useful Western ideas. Uh, and there's a kind of opening up to outside influences. One of the results of this is that young painters are sent abroad to study in Western academies. Guys like Xu Bei Hong, whose painting we're looking at here, um, as you can see, is actually, you can probably tell this just by looking at it, it's an oil painting. It's very different than traditional Chinese media. Much more use of color, much more representational, much more use of modeling and Western perspectival techniques to create a kind of Western-style oil painting. Although the subject here is obviously a man who's still wearing traditional garb, um, it is a painting in a Western style. Xu Bei Hong was one of this generation who was actually sent to learn chi Western painting techniques in Western art academies and then came back to China to teach in Chinese painting academies. With the um, revolution and the, the founding of the Republic in 1912, like I was saying, there are all these intellectual changes that are happening as well. Um, one of these is, in 1919, uh, a movement called the New Culture Movement in the early people's, or excuse me, Republic of China, the New Culture Movement, which was um, uh, this pr promoting the idea of embracing uh, and learning Western techniques for what uh, they could be used for in China, particularly classicism, romanticism, and impressionism. So um, Xu Bei Hong is one of these, one of these, um, individuals and there's also who's influenced by this uh, the of course with the end of the the um, Qing dynasty you have the end of essentially two millennia of imperial rule and remember one of the things that we have learned is that with imperial rule you've had this whole bureaucracy with the scholar literati class that puts the emphasis on um, calligraphy and self-cultivation um, there's going to be a shift in attitude in the 20th century with painters like Xu Bei Hong and others that painting is not just something for self-expression but it is something that can also serve the state and serve society so it's not just something that you do when you're drunk in a garden by yourself a new idea is taking hold here that, you know, this is also something that can be done for the public good. Um, Xu Bei Hong, here again, I'm just showing you some of his Western-style portrait paintings that he does in China and then in Singapore um, after having trained in the West. Uh, after the, the founding of the Republic, Xu Bei Hong actually became an um, important teacher in one of the main painting academies in China. So he was not only learning this, but he was also teaching it to a generation of students who, instead of studying in the old school style calligraphy and then um, painting in the literati tradition, they're going to be learning this more academic style of oil painting. Xu Bei Hong also did traditional literati style painting and he's as well known for this kind of stuff as he is for his oil painting so this is a grazing horse painting from 1932 or as you can see he's done the painting in a calligraphic style he's also done the uh, inscriptions on the painting He also, uh, she, one of, and I showed you that because, you know, he did, he had studied this traditional style as well as studying these, these more um, new to China styles of uh, Western painting. But he also starts to kind of marry the two together. And this is partly also influenced by 
um, seeing you know what's going on in modern art in the West. But here you can see this is a very nice example of marrying the Western and um, Chinese traditions together in this sketch of Mr. Kin Lo Chung from 1937 where you can see it is in monochrome and um, it has an, a colophon inscribed upon it but at the same time he's also borrowed some of the shading and um, modeling techniques that are more common in Western art and uh, applied them here to make a kind of naturalistic portrait of this individual and it's this kind of, of uh, realistic style married with tradition that he is going to be famous for. Let's see, and here's another nice example of his Western academic style painting here. So this is one of the important things that happens is this turning towards the West and seeing what can we learn from Western painting and Western art traditions that are not part of the past for us. You know, um, getting away from the traditional kind of cultivated scholarly elite painting where much like a lot of modern art in the West or contemporary art in the West, you really had to be... Um, a member of the literati or kind of inducted into some of the secrets so to speak to really get and really understand all the layers of a Chinese painting from the old scholar literati tradition. The oil paintings like this are more visually accessible, a little more readily understandable, um, a little less elite, you know. So this is also part of, of what's going on with the overthrow of the old imperial structure and trying to make a more egalitarian society. Um, another one of the, the early kind of transitional people who is going to take us from the Qing to the uh, Republic of China is this guy, Fu Baoshi, or Fu Baoshu. And Fu Baoshu is interesting because he does continue to paint. I mean, he, like his counterpart, um, Xu Bei Hong, does get sent to, a, in his case, a Parisian art academy to learn Western naturalism, and he does use it in his work. I mean, some of the details of this particular painting, which is in a traditional style and has some traditional um, subject matter, um, He's also using some Western techniques of shading and modeling. You can't see it too well here, uh, but in the face, and then in some of his other paintings he does as well. Uh, but Fu Baoshi is also a sort of um, um, less successful at becoming, uh, or, or at, at um, being, I, I guess I would say, you know, regime friendly to the Republic of China or the People's Republic of China after the transition in 1949 because he still holds on to some of these literati traditions. Let's see, here's a, a landscape from 1946, and here again you can see, uh, remember, by in the mid 40s, I mean, China had gone from um, uh, internal strife and civil war to being um, suffering actually greatly during World War II. They were attacked by Japan and invaded in the 30s by Japan. And then into the 40s, they were part of the global conflict of, of World War II. And so uh, Fu Baoshi had been uh, part of that. And you can kind of get a sense of his feeling of wanting to be in retreat and in isolation, uh, but that almost like nature can't even... Um, console him here, right? Like it's not substantial enough. There are some hints that he's been the, he's been looking at um, contemporary art in the West and that he had become familiar with the abstraction and the large scale um, the large scale kind of um, expressive painting that was being done in the West in the 20s and 30s and, and 40s um, th that he's marrying a little bit with his more traditional subject matter and use of um, ink uh, on paper. And here again, let's see, this is Fu Baoshi as well. And uh, traditional subject matter, scholar in retreat. Uh, but then again, you also have some Western-looking um, use of perspective here, right? In this, uh, like a window into a world as opposed to the, the random shift or the shifting perspective of, um, say, Northern Song landscape painting. Uh, so he's also marrying West and East in the, a different way maybe than we see with Xu Bei Hong. And they're both... Uh, but but that's sort of important about both of them, that they marry some element of the West with some element of the East in their painting. And let's see, I'm going to skip this one and move on to um, the other, oh, the another trend that we see that is not the sort of, I mean, Fu Baoshi and Xu Beihang both continue to work as artists um, who are in some ways, you know, being 
expressive of the self and have some um, ties to the scholar literati tradition, a new kind of really functional art emerges with the founding of the People's Republic of China. And or that is exemplified here with this Lo Gong Lu painting, uh, Mao Zedong reporting on the rectification in Yan An. This is a historical large-scale oil painting done in a realist fashion. And in fact, this style, this realistic, visually um, um, compelling kind of uh, illusion of a window into a three-dimensional world using oil paint is known as socialist realism. And in fact, this was the official style that was endorsed by Mao Zedong and then by the academies of art that were um, operating as official training grounds for new generations of artists. You didn't go and learn to do scholar literati painting in the People's Republic of China. You learned how to do um, serviceable